Hey everybody, what's going on? Um, thank you for uh, visiting my channel once again. Today we're going to talk about one of the most egregious uh, criminal cases uh, uh, in history uh, of New York State. Anyway, uh, dealing with entrapment, that's one prong. And the second prong is uh, due process. All right, the case that we're going to talk about today is People versus Isaacson. People versus I Isaacson. Okay, and this took place in a, uh, in New York State. Now, before we get into the particulars of the case, I want to talk about the two prongs and, and make sure we have a good working definition so that everybody is uh, on the same page. I don't think any black dude would think to say that because they know we know the law. Every black dude in this room is a qualified paralegal and shit. He knows the law. I mean, if one of us even start to do something wrong, an old black man would pop out of nowhere. Nigga, don't do that. That's five to ten. <laughs> Watch out. <sighs> well, we know the laws and the penalties. That so, um, of course, um, everybody has an idea. I would think of what entrapment what entrapment is, okay? But we need to work with these uh, within uh, legal parameters here. First, full disclosure: I'm not a lawyer, right? I just like to do a lot of research and reading. And if you've been following my channel over the years, you see I've read a lot of books, cover a lot of different uh, topics, things that I find uh, interesting. All right, and one of them is uh, law uh, cases that um, uh, are particularly interesting to me. So let's talk about entrapment first. So legal definition for entrapment, you know, simple um, uh, way to explain it is that basically when police uh, use tactics uh, that persuade or induce a person, right, who is normally not predisposed, right, the, to crime, to commit a crime, okay? So somebody that's not even thinking about right doing a crime they 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 have no plans right they're not in the the game so to speak right you get that person right through some kind of means right some trickery coercion maybe fear right intimidation to uh commit a crime and it has to be law enforcement right it's not just like um or an agent of law enforcement too like so it could be like a snitch or to be politically correct an informant right um Use my Barack Obama voice uh, as snitch or informant uh, <laughs> to produce the entrapment. All right. So you can tell me if my Obama voice is any good, too, by the way. Um, so it's definitely uh, police involvement. So you get a crooked cop, for example, stuff like that. All right. So somebody that normally wouldn't be committing a crime. And uh, coerce them or trick them somehow, maybe with like false information, right? To go out and um, uh, you know commit a crime, right? For example, maybe have some crooked cops. They see a young you know teenager walking home from school, and they're like, you know, you know, snatch him up and say, listen, you know, you're gonna carry this, you know, you know, drop this package off here every day and don't say nothing or X Y Z is gonna happen to you, right? That would be like an entrapment, right? So what what does it take to fulfill those uh, requirements in the law of actually someone being entrapped? Well, first you have to prove, right? Now you have to prove if you you it's an affirmative defense, meaning you as the person claiming to be entrapped, you have to prove that uh, law enforcement actually did it. So how do you do that? So first you must prove that you were not willing and ready to do whatever it is that you did. Like you didn't you didn't want to rob that bank. You didn't want to sell those drugs or possess those drugs, right? You have to prove that. That's one um prong of that. You have to prove that law enforcement provided the opportunity, right? In other words, they made available whatever it is, the gun or, or that you had or, or, or they gave you the money that you used to buy the drugs or they actually gave you the drugs, right? So you had to prove that they gave you the opportunity and then you have to prove that they also um coerced you or or uh you know uh persuaded you to do whatever it is you did so that's kind of hard that's kind of like hard um 
to do but it happens and that's why it's on the law book so that's entrapment you know layman's term in layman's terms in a nutshell now moving on to due process due process is basically um um put in place right in the fourth amendment it's put in place to protect the citizens okay from basically like the tyranny of the government and states it's, it's closely related to the fifth amendment actually um and it's basically put in place so that the government is um you know has some checks and balances so it's you know uh, law enforcement can't just like just uh, bust in your house uh, any suspicion and hey what are you doing or like open your come in let me see what's in your bag and stuff like that now you might say well they could do it at the airport this and that listen as time goes on right things are happening you know I don't want to get into all of that stuff because that that's like a whole nother discussion like Patriot Act and all that stuff but other acts have to be passed in order in amendments in order to circumvent these things like you know second you know second amendment fourth amendment and things like that so have to you have to you know look at it you know from that perspective um but these are why these amendments are, are put in place uh, protect the protect the people from from the tyranny um so you have uh the fourth amendment is there and basically it's saying listen we we you know we want you know bad people off the street and and criminals and people that are gonna tear down the society, okay. However, you have to follow, you know these guidelines in order to bring them to justice. It can't just be haphazard, where you know just like uh, you have like say like a George Zimmerman type, just running around like hey he looked guilty pa 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 and I shot him you know, and that's it. No, there has to be a due process. Where, okay, there's like some kind of suspicion to raise. Maybe neighbors are complaining. Hey, this person's doing whatever. Okay, then there's observation of said activity. Okay, now we see him in the act or uh, her in the act or whatever. Okay, now the apprehension is is made. Okay, with the respect to life. That's all, again, all these shootings and stuff like that. All that has to do, that has, has to do with due process also. Okay, because... You know, the objective at the end is to bring the person uh, to justice, right? Rehabilitate them, and then they come out and um, become um, quality members of society, right? Not They're not supposed to just be getting killed, uh, you know, just, you know, over whatever, drunk driving, you know, things like, like that. Okay, but again, that's a different can of worms there. I'm just letting you know, due process is saying that basically the governments uh, of these states and towns, municipalities, what have you, you know, have to follow certain guidelines. It, it's not, this is not, uh, you know, the era of divine right of kings where they could just confiscate your property or just search your property at will. Or just tell you, you know, just um, any suspicion you know, you're going to the gallows or whatever you mean. You know, uh, your neighbor said, hey, uh, this guy was doing such and such. And then they just execute you the next day. A right? due process prevents all of that. So those are the two major things, um, uh, pillars in this case. People versus Isaacson is the entrapment and the due process. So please like and subscribe. Um, and we're going to um, get into the particulars of this case right now. So enjoy. Okay. So now it's time to uh, introduce the players here. So we have, of course, we have uh, Eddie Isaacson here. And we have a guy named John uh, John P. Brenneman. And uh, a lady named Denise Marcone. So first we're going to start with uh, John uh, Brenneman. John Brenneman was the informant uh, for the police. Um, he was, you know, a criminal. Uh, he had a, a felony already, okay? And what happened was that uh, he had a drug problem and he was a, a addict slash drug dealer. He wasn't a big time drug dealer, but he was selling also, um, you know, basically getting high on his own supply, as they would say. In the hood, <laughs> you know, he was hustling and using at the same time. He he wasn't going anywhere, okay, with that. Um, so what happened is 
Brenneman already had a, a felony on his record uh, for amphetamines, right? Possession of amphetamines. And for you young people, amphetamines are basically um, uh, like speed or uppers, things things that get you get you amped up. So, for instance, uh, example would be Adderall. So everybody knows what Adderall is. Adderall, Dexedrin, uh, you know, have your eyes, you know, you bugging out, you know, you just like ready, ready, ripping, you know, you know, ready to go, right? Um, those are what amphetamines are, or speed, as they would uh, call it, right? Um, so that's what that is. If you if you don't know what an, an amphetamine is, those are uh, two solid uh, examples. So what happens with this guy Brenneman is so he gets arrested on December 23rd. I'm sorry, December 20th of 1974, right for possession once again, right for um for drugs, and uh, so it's gonna be his second felony, right? And you know Nixon is out of office, but he's already declared the war on drugs, um, and you know he's gonna go off state for a long time. Okay, and um, this is before they had any of uh, those like, you know, drug courts and uh, programs where they could go to some kind of boot camp and, you know, come out and, you know, have a second chance. It was more, things were a little more draconian. So this dude doesn't want to go to jail. So he says, he because he, he, he's got caught with a bunch of pills, right? So he says, hey, you know, I work with you guys, you know, with the police, you know, he decides to become an informant. But here's the plot twist, right? And here's, this is where you start getting dirty in the due process and all of that. So three days later, December 23rd, lab tests come back. The pills are the pills are fake. So the cops really don't have anything on this dude. However, they don't tell him. They just keep that information because he's already, he's like, hey, I'm going to be in the foreman already, you know, and he talks with his lawyer, you know, to get his 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 you know penalties reduced right so he doesn't go to jail for 20 years so he's under the the idea that he's in all of this trouble meanwhile there's the pills are in, you know it's, it's just junk right they, they have they have to basically just let him go right they don't tell him though they tell him when he's done his job as an informant already but we get <laughs> get over so this this case is crazy so they kind of like this like man we don't got nothing but hey he's gonna be our informant we're gonna let this dude put in work all right so this guy um he knows our defendant here um ed isaacson ed isaacson is a unique guy um this dude is is on the verge of getting his phd from uh penn state in uh physiology i believe it was um smart dude no criminal record right and you know, he's a drug dealer. He's selling, you know, selling drugs. He's probably coming from that 60s counterculture, you know, smoke a little weed, you know, have a little, make a little extra money, right? Not big time, just like this guy Brenneman is not a big time dude, okay? But they know each other, of course, being in similar, you know, these drug circles, right? So Brenneman has known him for a couple of years. He's bought from him. So um, as far as meeting that uh, criteria of being predisposed or not predisposed to commit the crime, Isaacson does not meet the criteria for entrapment because he's 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 engaged in criminal activity. He kind of, he sells drugs. Uh, he knows how to package the drugs, right? Uh, he, he's willing. Okay, but we'll we'll get into more uh, more of that later. So what happens is, so um, Isaac uh, Brenneman you know, tells the cops like, hey, I know this guy or whatever, you know, but at first the cops, uh, you know, are trying to get him to get guys, you know, deals in, in New York. After all, this is a New York, he's caught in New York, uh, Brenneman. Um, remember, uh, Isaacson is, is from Pennsylvania, right? He's, uh, he's, um, you know, going to Penn State University, right? He lives in an apartment pursuing his PhD. And um, so this is a very important um, fact in the case. Is um, Isaacson is in Pennsylvania, Brenneman is from New York, and in the case, the the cops are from New York. They catch Brenneman in New York, and this is so he's trying to call drug dealers that he knows in New York, and set them up. 
And, um, you know, he's not getting a bite. Right? He calls like one or two dudes. Nobody, nobody's going for it. <laughs> you know, they're probably like, hey, man, this guy's got arrested. Who know? Who knows what the the thought was? You know, what the what the nineteen seventies mindset was? You know, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so basically, he can't get anybody in New York. So he tells the cops that he says, "Hey, I know this guy in PA. I know this guy in PA. I can call him. I've known him for a couple of years, and I, I'll try to make something happen." Okay, so I'll leave that there. Now, the third part, the third partner in the in the crime here is um, this lady named Denise Marcone, who lived with uh, Isaacson in uh, PA. That was like his girlfriend that he testified in trial. That was his girl, lived with them uh, two, three years. Um, no plot to us there. Of course, she wound up testifying against Isaacson, right? A lot of people do, right? They say they're gonna be there, but they can't. <laughs> you know that 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 always hurts, right? You think a person is about, they're gonna be loyal and all that, they're gonna stay with you, then it's kind of like it gets too hot. It gets too hot, and they people do what they gotta do, and uh, so she she wound up testifying against um, uh, Isaacson. So those are the three uh, main uh, players. Like she did drugs herself. Right, she's in a life. Like I said, these guys were all like kind of like low level um, uh, drug dealers or whatever. So finally, um, um, Brenneman gets through to Isaacson. You know, they, um, you know, strike a deal for, you know, like a bunch of pills, you know, you know, like a thousand pills, you know, a, a good amount of, of cocaine, you know, and however, the transaction has to be done in New York. Remember, this is a New York investigation. Dudes from PA, right? Um, so he's calling Isaacson. He's called Isaacson like seven times. Finally, he gets through to the guy because he was kind of reluctant, you know? But what he did was he told Isaacson the story. Remember, I was telling you about this coercion and all the stuff like that with the entrapment. He tells Isaacson the story. He's like, listen, man, I'm jammed up. Like, you know, I've, I've gotten uh, gotten arrested. These dudes are going to send me to prison for, for a long time, for 20 years. You know, it's going to be my second felony. He tells them the story. Like, listen, man, I'm in trouble, man. I need to raise some money so that I can, you know, bail out and, you know, get get a proper legal team together. So this is where the drugs come in. He's like, hey, man, like, sell, you know, sell me some drugs, you know. I'll go, you know, I'll go sell them and that way I have enough money to bail out. Uh, I'll, I'll be, you know, bail me out, of course. I'll have enough money to, to get a legal team together, et cetera, et cetera. So he hits him with that, you know, that kind of sob story or whatever. So Isaacson is like, all right, I'll help you, you know. So Isaacson um, and Brennerman decide to meet in a town uh, called uh, Lawrenceville, uh, Pennsylvania. You'll be able to see that uh, on, on the map. And Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania is like right close, like next to um, New York, the New York border. It's like south of the border. And, and it's important because the laws are different in New York and, and in Pennsylvania, right? Isaacson didn't want to go to New York because he said, you know, in, in court that, hey, these drug laws are off the hook. They're out outrageous. I'm not going there, right? So... What happened is you have this game now of cat and mouse where Brenneman continues to like switch the locations around, you know, like, and he, what he's doing is he's gradually moving further up north in an attempt to cross the border, but without Isaacson really knowing it. Um, I don't know if many of you out there, how many of you are familiar with like upstate New York. But basically, once you get out of New York City, it's basically country for a long time. Like, you have New York City, and then you have, like, 60 miles of, like, country. Then you get into, like, Hudson Valley area. Yeah, there's a few cities, but it's nothing like New York City. And the further you go up north, it gets more and more rural. This area, like, Hudson Valley area, uh, what, like, Middletown, Port Jervis. Or, yeah, these are, like, small cities. Newburgh, uh, shout out to Newburgh. Um, right, these are like small, small uh, cities, but nothing compared to like New York City or like Houston and these, you know, um, you know, ATL, like big, you know, cities like that. 
Um, so there's a lot of like rural areas where you can drive like on these back roads and cross the border and you won't even know it. Right? There'll be like a little stone somewhere. Welcome to uh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to New York, you know? And so this is what happened in this case. Is so they're supposed to meet at Lawrenceville and then he agrees to that, you know? Okay, Isaacson says, you know, it's like an hour and change away. He agrees. But then... Uh, Brenneman said, no, no, let's meet, you know, a little further up. And so he keeps switching the location until they finally uh, agreed to meet at this bar, which is like right on the border, New York and Pennsylvania. But of course, it's on the New York side. But it's like a rural rural area where you can't really tell where, you, where you're at almost, right? So needless to say, they go meet at this bar, the set the sting is in. Isaacson uh, gets popped, you know, the drugs and all that stuff. And the, where the girlfriend comes into play is she was driving the other car. So what it was is they had the setup where um, Isaacson had like some fake drugs on him. So like say if he got robbed or something, the person would get, take the stuff from him and then realize it was nothing. Once he found out everything was legit, the girl, the girl would, um, you know, deliver the real stuff in the other car. So that's that's how it went down. So when when the sting happened, the girl got popped too, and so of course she worked out an immunity deal. She testified against Isaacson, and she took like um like probation for life, like some ridiculous um like a ridiculous sentence, pro like lifetime probation. I had never even heard of that before. Goodness gracious, um, and Isaacson is charged with a class A one felony, and um which is like a first degree you know, um, crime. And anytime you hit first degree, you know, it's like the worst, um, of possession of controlled substance. So they, you know, he's facing 15, um, years of life, eventually goes to trial. He loses in the New York, uh, criminal court system. And he's, um, he's sentenced, you know, they send this dude to Attica. Now I don't know if you know about Attica, but that prison had like a rough history, especially in the seventies. They actually had that famous Attica riots, where the inmates actually took over the prison and they shut it down for three days and held the um, officers hostage there. Right, There's some good documentaries on YouTube. Uh, they'll say, um, you're here now, you're in Attica. We are the bosses. We do what we tell you. When we tell you to walk, you walk. When we tell you to eat, you eat. When we tell you to sleep, you sleep. When we tell you not to talk, we don't talk. And they don't look at us like human beings. Meanwhile, they are the ones that are the animals. And it functions you in a capacity as more or less like a vegetable because you're not able to think anymore because you're told what to do and when to do and how often to do it, right? I, mean, I don't think that any sane person can tolerate it. I don't care who you are. riot eventually like the uh, I think it was the, um, the National Guard had to come in and um, like 40 people got killed I think it was like 31 inmates and nine civilians it was crazy um, so you know that's where he this guy no criminal record right <laughs> he gets you know going for his PhD right all of a sudden he's sitting in Attica or whatever so he goes through the um, you know the appeal system and uh, I'll put a little chart there also to show you how the New York appeal system works. But basically, a court of appeals is the highest court in New York State. So I know you're used to hearing like the Supreme Court, like for the United States, that's the highest court in the land. But in New York State, it's the court of appeals. The Supreme Court is actually a lower court. Court of appeals is the final, uh, you know, has the final say. So what happened was, you know, Isaacson is trying to, you know, get his case uh, overturned on this entrapment um, deal, you know, due, pro due process, etc. And um, it goes all the way um, to uh, to the court 
of a pill. So I'm going to share with you like some of the um, the wisdom of the court and, you know, what they found in that case because they can say it uh, more uh, eloquently than I can. I thought it was beautiful, but the case uh, eventually uh, was uh, thrown out. So I'm going to just share with you uh, some, some words uh, from the court. So here are a few words from Justice uh, Dillon. Um, now, he's one of the justices on, on the appellate courts. And he talks about entrapment here and how why the entrapment defense does not work uh, here for Isaacson. And if you listen to what I said in the beginning, you will understand clearly too. However, so what Dillon says here is he says, defendant next urges that the evidence substantiates his defense of entrapment. In light of recent decisions of the Supreme Court in United States versus Russell and Hampton versus United States, we will consider defendant's argument in conjunction with his further claim that he was denied due process of the law. There's the second prong. Remember that. So we note first that the New York entrapment defense derives from the federal standards committed in Sorrells versus U.S. and Sherman versus U.S., it is not available to one who regularly engages in criminal enterprise. So this is what I was talking about. He's like a known drug dealer. This is what he does. So it was, it's a wrap on that defense. The evidence of other criminal acts of a de defendant may be introduced on the people's case in chief in order to refute the defense of entrapment. People versus men. Such conduct shows that the defendant was otherwise disposed to commit uh, the offense. So they shut him down on the entrapment side. Without reciting the trial court's findings, it is sufficient to note that the record amply supports its determination that the defendant was predisposed to commit the offense for which he was charged. While it is not clear that, while it, I'm sorry, while it is clear that the defendant did not intend to enter New York to sell cocaine, but intended only to sell it in PA, the fact that he was lured in to New York is of no avail to him as regards this statutory defense. So isn't that something, right? Because a normal person would think, man, this agent of law enforcement, right? This this informant went through all this shady stuff to get this dude from from a state where, you know, they had no jurisdiction over the border just so they could arrest this this one drug dealer. So you would say that's definitely entrapment, like. If, you know, like, what is entrapment? But once you read the statutes and you realize that he can't, he can't even use uh, that defense, even though to, like, our common sense, it seems like, like, this is wrong in so many places, right? This guy calls, 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 lies to him, right? Tells him this story. And then he's like, yeah, hey, come, come, uh, you know, keep coming up north. The fact that the guy was already a drug dealer, already... Uh, you know, quote unquote, predisposed to it, invalidated his defense of entrapment. That only left him with um, uh, due process. You know that other that other uh, prong of the defense. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that um, right now. So I forgot. I forgot to say. I want to mention this before I before I get uh, too far. I forgot to mention. So after um, after excuse me after uh, Isaacson was convicted, right in the criminal court, right he appealed, and so the next level up was the the appellate division. So what I just read from uh, Justice Dillon, that was um, from the appellate division, which is the step below the uh, Supreme Court. So he appealed there and Isaacson actually lost that appeal to the at the appellate level. Three to two. So three judges affirmed what the lower court had had um, adjudicated. Two dissented. So Justice Dillon was one of the judges that supported the conviction. He was saying you know he shut down the entrapment defense. He was like, hey, there's no way um, this guy was uh, uh, entrapped, all right? He was already predisposed, what have you. So now what I'm going to share with you uh, is from the dissent, right? Remember, it was three to two. So um, Dylan wrote the opinion for the majority. 
uh, and Justice Cardamone uh, wrote the uh, opinion for the dissenters who believe that, uh, hey, this is uh, this was this is outrageous. But notice, is not gonna the dissent is not gonna uh, be based on entrapment. They agree, hey, there's no entrapment here. This guy was predisposed to do this. However, they uh, disagreement comes on due process. So let's uh, check out uh, Cardamone's, Justice Cardamone's um, um, uh, comments here and the uh, dissent, the three to two dissent at the appellate division. And this is what caused it to wind up going all the way up to the uh, Court of Appeals. So here's uh, Justice Cardamone here, and I'll go through this briefly. So. He, he just sums up the case real quick and he says, uh, after three unsuccessful attempts to set up drug buys for police in New York State, as I told you before, Brenneman called the defendant with whom he had previous dealings. Brenneman's calls to the defendant in Pennsylvania were born of desperation and panic. He related his arrest, that he was beaten by the police, right? He didn't have any friends, needed money. He, in other words, he told him a story. He said, hey man, help me out here. You, you know, he's trying to and trap him in the, in the, in the doing this. I needed money for a lawyer. He was facing 15 years of life, etc., etc. Brenneman asked the defendant to get some, some heroin, which defendant refused to do. Finally, when defendant agreed to come, the police furnished Brenneman with the money necessary to buy the drugs. The defendant, Isaacson, is a 26-year-old graduate student and teacher at the undergraduate level at Penn State University on the verge of earning his PhD in plant physiology and biochemistry. He has no previous criminal record. So man, to, I mean, my, the first thought I have is, wow, to destroy this guy's life, the guy looks like he's on the verge of doing something great, right? You never know, he might discover a new medicine, you know, some some type of treatment for cancer, whatever. The guy, the guy that's why I'm not saying he should be above the law, but geez, right? Continuing, our system of justice is founded upon a basic commitment to respect the rights of all persons and serves as an assurance to them that they remain free to make choices without coercion or fraudulent deception by police authorities. Prosecution in this case should be barred because the undisputed and, in fact, conceded governmental action is so shocking to our sense of fairness that it must be held to violate standards of what? Due process. Regardless of the defendant's predisposition, so he, in other words, he said, "Hey, you got that on the uh, um, the uh, entrapment part." He said, "Regardless of the defendant's predisposition, when the government, through its agents, engages in reprehensible conduct, the judicial focus must be on the police conduct, right?" And I want to take that time to say to all those people out there like anytime there's like these police shootings they want to look at the dude who got shot like oh he shouldn't have been running or he didn't comply or um you know he he, he was a criminal anyway and all that stuff the law the law justice is supposed to be ab above that you see it's he, justice cardamon is is, is uh, very eloquent here he's saying listen Yes, this dude, this dude was shady. Yes, he he shouldn't have been, you know, selling drugs, right? However, regardless of the defendant's predisposition, no matter what the defendant is doing, when the government, through its agents, engages in reprehensible conduct, the judicial focus must be on police conduct. In other words, the police have to be above the criminal, right? It's not criminals versus criminals. It's supposed to be police, right? The good guys versus the bad guys. In such, and I continue, in such an inquiry, the defendant's actions are not controlling. A majority of the United States Supreme Court have recently stated that where police misconduct may be characterized as quote unquote outrageous, a conviction is subject to dismissal on what? Due process grounds. Then he gives a couple of um, case cases, Hampton versus U.S., um, Rochin versus California. Um... It goes on, this is consistent with the Supreme Court statement that we are duly mindful of the reliance that society must place for achieving law and order upon the enforcing agencies of the criminal law. In other words, this is the backbone of society, right? So if the agencies are going to be shady and lawless, then you have no, you're not going to have a society. Soon as the society will just break down, 
right? If the cops are just running wild, if the cops are selling drugs and shooting people and all stuff like that, your society will break down, okay? But insistence on observance by law officers of traditional fair procedural requirements is, from the long point of view, best calculated to contribute to that end, okay? Um, then he goes on to talk about, you know, eminent jurists have expressed similar sentiments where police conduct falls below the proper standard. And that's, again, that's what I was saying. That's what due process is about, uh, holding the authority accountable. Right, because with the power has to come the responsibility. You can't just have the power and just do what do whatever you want, or just have this um, uh, ends justifies the means approach. Okay, again, that's going to cause society to break down because once you lose the trust of the, you can't trust the government or law enforcement. You you just have people just doing you know chaos and no order. Right, order order can only be established through 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 trust. You know, because people won't listen if they don't trust and believe. Okay? <clears throat> he goes on. The government may set decoys to entrap criminals. Right? So, for instance, like, what's a decoy? Say, like, prostitution thing. Right? They have a, a, a nice-looking lady, right? Undercover officer out there walking the streets, and then the guy goes up, solicits her, whatever, offers money, and then, bang, he gets, gets arrested. See, that's not entrapment. It's set that that's setting uh, uh setting up a decoy, right? Because they're not provoking, you know, forcing you or tricking you to 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 go get the prostitute. Right? It's just creating the the situ the atmosphere, and then you are taking it from there. So the government may set decoys to entrapment criminals, but it may not provoke or create a crime, <laughs> right? Provoke or create a crime, and then punish the criminal. Right? It's creature. This prosecution should be stopped. Okay? In order to protect the government. To protect it from illegal conduct of its officers. Okay? So, he goes on and that's, you know, with that argument for a little while long, of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing. These arguments uh, can be very long, but I wanted you to hear, like, you know, the wisdom of the court and, the, um, you know, the way that, um, you know, that... He expressed himself, you know, in such a beautiful uh, manner. Um, I do want to share with you this last paragraph. So he says, We recognize fully that the power to overturn a conviction upon the ground that law enforcement agents engaged in impermissible conduct should be exercised sparingly and only in rare cases. So he's not saying, hey, every time a cop does something, you just overturn a conviction. Right? But he says, nonetheless, when such practices are revealed, they are firmly subject subject to due process limitations. Applicable here is the ancient maxim, the end does not justify the means. In our view, the police conduct in this case so far departs from those values which our government is designed to protect that it becomes the duty of the courts to refuse to countenance it despite the conceded violation of the state penal law. Then he says, accordingly, we dissent to vote to reverse the judgment of conviction and dismiss the indictment. So that was his beautiful, um, you know, eloquent summary, you know, of the case and um, a great uh, 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 dissertation on due process. Just fantastic. So, again, like I said, you had those two prongs. You had the the uh, entrapment side, which obviously Mr. Isaacson didn't fall into, and then he had the due process side, and this is the argument. Now, at this appellate division, fortunately for Mr. Isaacson, um, um, he would lose in spite of the eloquent argument from uh, Justice uh, Carterman. Um, three, three justices affirmed the lower court's decision, right, to keep that guy locked up, and so um, in our next and final part, we're going to see what happened at the highest uh, court in New York State, which is uh, the uh, Court of Appeals. So um, I hope you're still there listening. Um, please like and subscribe um, and, um, you know, tell you know, tell me how you feel about these uh, things and how this relates to things that are going on uh, today out there. So here I just wanted to take a, a brief moment and just show you what the, the court uh, structure uh, look like uh, real quick so you can see at the very top is the Court of Appeals here 
So what I was just reading is from the decision from the appellate divisions, right? So from here, you can see if you go down, you have Supreme Courts, Family Courts, and uh, Court of Claims, Surrogates Court, all these like lower courts, right? So in the criminal, um, you know, level or whatever, you know, you start out in these, uh, you know, city courts and town courts, and these like usually deal with... Uh, uh, less serious crimes, right? Like traffic, traffic tickets, uh, misdemeanors and things like that. And as things get more serious, they go up right to like Supreme court, right? Where you might have like felony cases, like where this, this guy Isaacson was, right? So what happened was he lost his, his case in the Supreme court of New York state, right? He lost his case there. He gets sentenced, he, you know, 15 years. So now 15 to life. So now his lawyer's appeal and that's the first step they go to the appellate division they want to get things overturned he loses here he loses here three to two okay this is where i just read from and now he he has a last shot the court of appeals and if the court of appeals uh shuts him down that's pretty much it right i mean he could try to go to like the supreme court of the united states but that's really difficult so this is really like his last le legit shot is that um uh, court of Appeals here. So this is uh, where we're going to uh, uh, pick up. So here I'm going to pick up uh, the um, Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, Honorable um, Judge um, Cook, uh, who was the, um, he was the head honcho. He was, he was the, uh, the big dog, right? He was the Chief Justice of the highest court in New York State from uh, 1979 to 1984 when he retired at the ripe age of 70 which is actually the the limit right so you can't be a judge after that so he had to retire but I want to pick up with his comments and he's gonna give a little more insight on um, what actually you know what actually took place um, concerning this guy Brenneman and um, luring this guy Isaacson across the border all right, so here's uh, Judge uh, Justice Cook here. Defendant, and he's speaking on behalf of the majority, by the way. So what it is is you will have, um, you know, the um, the majority would have one representative uh, speak, and the dissent would have, um, you know, uh, somebody speak on their behalf. So Justice Cook, uh, Chief Justice, is speaking on behalf of the um, majority, right? So the, where the case was actually uh, overturned, and this is what set Isaacson free, the Court of Appeals. So he had did like you know like three years you know three years behind bars at this point. But here we go. I'll pick it up here. So defendant feared New York's drug laws. Of course, he's talking about Isaacson, and did not want to enter the state. But the investigator instructed Brenneman that the transaction must take place in New York where he had an authority to make an arrest. To cause defendant to sell drugs in this state, Brenneman cleverly kept changing the destination, progressively northward, right as I mentioned earlier, culminating in an arrangement by which defendant would make a three or four hour trip to meet at a place near the Pennsylvania New York border. At a spot where it would be difficult for defendant to ascertain his location. Initially, defendant agreed to meet in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, one and a half hours distant from State College. That's Penn State. Brenneman then succeeded in inducing defendant to commit himself to journey to Mansfield, a point near Williamsport and also in the Quaker State. Finally, he acceded to drive another 15 miles north from Mansfield to Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, which is just south of the state boundary. The meeting place finally settled upon uh, was the Whiffle Tree Bar, which Brenneman told defendant was in Lawrenceville. What Brenneman did know and defendant did not know, here's the key, was that the bar was actually in the town of Lindley, Steuben County, New York. Traveling north on Route 15 in Pennsylvania toward Lawrenceville, the only clear indication a motorist might have that he is leaving Pennsylvania is a sign adjacent to the southerly approach 
of a bridge spanning the Koenisk River, excuse my pronunciation, I know that's wrong, and welcoming the travel to New York State. Okay, so you can see that this guy, this informant, right, he went to went through great lengths, right? So this guy, rep remember, this guy represents the arm of the, the law here. He went through great efforts to get this dude into New York, okay? Um, and even still, with all of that, right, all of that extra over-the-top, like, I'm not going to lie, like, it. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of money for the 70s, but... With all of that movement, like if I if I was hustling, I, I'm I'm not doing it. Like all of that extra, okay, we going here, we going here. Like there'll be like red flags all over, red flags all over the place, you know. So and maybe he had some red flags, but he he figured that you know he deal with it somehow. But anyway, like all of that moving, oh we coming here, no we're going going to go further, no we meet at this place and all that. That's crazy. Justice Cook goes on and says, defendant engaged in a rather elaborate method of delivering the cocaine, including an arrangement to have Denise Marcone, his girlfriend, drive along in a separate vehicle conveying the contraband and the toting beneath his shirt of a plastic bag containing a non-narcotic substance with a cocaine appearance to be turned over in the event of a ripoff. See, so he was kind of, you know, hey, in case he gets robbed, he could get it like whatever he had, bleach or whatever, uh, you know, detergent or something like that. Like, hey, take that, drive off, and you know. So he had like some old school 1970s. You know, you're not gonna rip me off methods. You know, at use here, okay? Um, you know, some old school stuff right there. You know, <laughs> um. So anyway, dude winds up getting arrested, and his uh, Brenneman, the informant, right, causes you know the witness or whatever. And the defendant's former girlfriend, right, who testified for prosecution in return for a promise of lifetime probation for her part in the sale. That sounds crazy, too. But she agreed agreed to it, you know. And I'm kind of glad this dude got off, man, because it's kind of like, man, everybody turned on him. Dudes, like, went out of their way to set this guy up. Girlfriend, you know, you know, let, you know, just turn on them and everything and you know she agreed to lifetime probation that's that's ridiculous that, oh man um so i'm gonna move a little further and see what he has to say again about due process and then we'll i'll look at the dissent and then out of that we'll wrap it up right there so once again here uh justice cook you know he goes through the same arguments. He he shuts down the whole idea of entrapment. He just basically sums it up, says, following a trial without without a jury at which defendant raised the defense of entrapment and urged that his due process rights were violated. The judge, the county judge found him guilty of criminal sale of controlled substance in the first degree and imposed sentence. The appellate division, which we just had read before this, affirmed, but two justices vigorously dissented and I had read you one, uh, you know, the affirmation, one from the affirmation and one from the dissent, talking about the due process. And basically, Justice Cook says the same thing. That hey, like, <laughs> listen, yeah, yeah, entrapment out the window, you know. And if if that's anything I want to pass on is like entrapment is like very hard to hard to prove, right? You more you you have better chance with uh, the due process. So it says, in holding that this prosecution should be barred, we find it ne unnecessary to examine in detail the question of whether this defendant was predisposed to commit the crime. Okay, um, so we already discussed that, like the whole the whole idea that this guy was already a drug dealer, the elaborate method that he used to to bring the drugs with the extra car, the girlfriend in the car, he had stuff taped up. Like so, in other words. You're not going to be able to get away with the entrapment, even though it sounds crazy, like all the stuff that this guy, Brenneman, along with the um, the officers have went through, okay, to, um, you know, to get them into the state, you know, but that's where the due process, um, that's where the due process uh, comes in, okay? 
so finally, I want to say that uh, Cook says about due process. He says, while due process is a flexible doctrine, certain types of police action manifest a disregard for cherished principles of law and order. Right? Does that sound familiar like today? I mean, right? Upon an inquiry to determine whether due process principles have been transgressed in a particular factual frame, there's no precise line of demarcation. Okay, so you got to take it, you know, instance by instance, in other words. Okay? And break down, like, exactly, okay, what, what happened here? Okay? So then he goes and says, okay, some factors to be considered are, did the police manufacture a crime which otherwise would not likely have occurred? Right? Or did they merely involve themselves in an ongoing criminal activity? Okay, give some case law there. Two, whether the police themselves engaged in criminal or improper conduct repugnant to a sense of justice, right? Or three, whether the defendant's reluctance to commit the crime is overcome by appeals to humanitarian instincts, such as sympathy or past friendship, by temptation of exorbitant gain, or by persistent solicitation in the face of unwillingness. And four, whether the re record reveals simply a desire to obtain a conviction with no reading that the police motive is to prevent further crime or protect the populace. Okay, so then he goes on to say hey, hey, that no one of these factors by themselves is going to determine, right, um, be determinative, but each should be viewed in combination with all pertinent aspects. Okay, so everything um, uh, put together. Okay. Then he goes on, okay, a prosecution conceived in or nurtured by such conduct as exemplified in these guidelines so as to cast aside and mock that fundamental fairness essential to the very concept of justice should be forbidden under traditional due process principles. So you can see that the due process, the, the, the outrageousness, the due process uh, violation of due process is what saved this guy here, right? The fact that, like, they lied to this guy, uh, Brenneman, right, about the drug results, right? He's thinking that he's going, you know, he has to do this, right? He's going to go up, go upstate forever. And meanwhile, they don't even have any drugs. They have some fake, fake pills, but they not, they're not going to tell him. Okay? Um, right? They, the fact that they went through all of this stuff to get the guy to go from Pennsylvania to New York. All right. This is all like this violation, you know, of, of uh, due process. Okay. So, Justice Cook, in his wisdom, he goes through the factors that we just mentioned. So, he says, applying these factors to the case. First, we find the manufacture and creation of a crime. Right, because that's basically what happened is is the dude didn't even want to come to New York, but the dude kept kept driving further and further up, and next thing you know, he's in New York committing a crime. Like he wouldn't have been in New York if it weren't for the police. That's the first, <laughs> you know. I'm ad libbing here, of course. Justice Cook is not, you know, talking like that. Um, so he says, applying these factors to this case, first we find the manufacturing creation of a crime. At most, and over his denial, the record shows that the defendant had made small and rather casual sales of drugs. So he was a small time guy. Like he was, a, you could tell he was a college dude. He's trying, he's he's trying to get his PhD, right? He wants to he wants to study plants and stuff, right? He's he's making a little money on the side. He's chilling, you know. Not saying it's, it's right or whatever, you know, whatever morals you have. But I'm just saying he he's not uh, Escobar or whatever. He's not. Right, he's not trying to take over the world, you know. He made small and rather casual sales of drugs. Indeed, it was established that he did not himself have access to the quantity of drugs sought by Brenneman and for which he was arrested. Okay, it says, but was only directed to the source by one who testified against him. So the informant was like, Oh, go to this dude, he, he has the drugs. Now, it doesn't say why he. Wouldn't just turn and say, well, why don't you go to him? Because the, the informant actually 
told him who to get it from. Um, so anyway, it says, doubtless a crime of this magnitude would not have occurred without active and insistent encouragement from, from the police and their agent. Then he says, turn it to the second component, serious police mi misconduct repugnant to a sense of justice is revealed. He said, initially there was conceded abuse of a Brenneman at the sub substation. So when uh, Brenneman had said he got beat up by the cops and they threatened him and all stuff like that. So there's that. And that, that was, um, it was conceded by law enforcement. While this harm was visited upon a third party it cannot be overlooked. Okay, for to do so would be to accept police brutality as long as it was not pointed directly at the defendant. See, so Isaacson wasn't beat down, but the informant was beat down. Okay. So now I'm going to go up a little bit. So the third factor embraces what? A persistent effort to overcome defendant's reluctance to commit the crime. So again, dude, you know, Isaacson didn't want, you know, he was he he didn't want to drive four hours and come across the border and all that, right? So it says Brenneman, as an informant, played upon defendant's sympathy, their past relationship. Like, yo, man, I remember I told you how to drive. Like, remember we used to play basketball together. Yeah, man, I remember we was in wrestling, you know, high school wrestling. You know, he he hit him with the the emotion, hit him, you know, hit hit him hit him in the heart, you know, past relationship. You know, oh man, I was at your wedding, man. Yo, you know. Had good times, man. You know, like Wu Tang Clan said, you know, remember 1979? You know, he like, you know, pulled her the heartstrings, you know? Ah, past relationship and preserved and persevered in his request despite defendant's obvious unwillingness. More, moreover, even if defendant was motivated by expectation of profit, the law of exorbitant gain is not a proper basis to create crime for the purpose of obtaining convictions. Right, with resistance or undermine, even a person not predisposed predisposed to crime, predisposed to crime may be enticed to violate the law. And then finally, here's a fourth prong: there is the overriding police desire for conviction of any individual. You know, and nowadays we will use the word thirsty. The cops were thirsty for whatever reason to get a conviction. That just shows thirstiness, like. This of a different level Like you You don't have enough drug dealers in New York Like you gotta go get a dude from Pennsylvania And bring him into your state and, and arrest him That is That's crazy So Cook says In this respect One is immediately shocked By an incredible Geographical shell game A deceit I love that Geographical shell game A deceit which affected defendants Unknowing and unintended passage across the border into the state. While this outright fraud was ostensibly accomplished by an informant, he was acting at the who? Behest of the police. That's why I say he's the, he's the arm, he's a representative of law enforcement, who emphasized that the sale must take place in New York and thus are chargeable with the tactics employed by their agents. See Johnson versus United States. All right. Then he says, of course, in a particular case, it may be necessary for the police to apprehend a criminal, a criminal who operates outside our borders. But this is not such a situation. And I could think of examples like that. They say a guy living in another state and he's he's just continuous, has some kind of continuous criminal enterprise and, you know, bringing stuff in, you know, from another state into the board, into your state. I can see that. He said, but here, this is not the situation. There's no suggestion that defendant had previously sold great quantities of cocaine. In short, the police wanted a conviction and simply set two specifications, a large amount of substance to denote a high grade of crime and um, citrus of sale in New York. So basically get a lot of cocaine, have the sale be in New York. They didn't really care who it was or anything. It says there was no indication of any desire to prevent crime by cutting off the source and thus the conviction obtained Became little more than a statistic. So he just like arrested like a random dude. And, um, you know, um, put him through all this stuff. And again, God wasn't innocent, but that's not the point. The point is that the law, you know, justice is supposed to be above, above the level of the uh, criminal uh, activity. Okay? 
So I'm gonna leave it there on the the um on the affirmation, you know, um that uh actually uh got Isaacson uh out of jail, you know. And of course the dissent uh from um Justice uh Gabrielli, um you know, he, you know, he doesn't agree. I'm not going to go into the dissent. Like I said, this video has been uh, uh, long enough. But, um, the, you know, basically, um, the the uh, highest court, the Court of Appeals, have voted this time in uh, Isaacson's uh, favor. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you. I hope you liked that video. Please like and subscribe. Let me know if you want me to uh, do more more of those uh cases like that i thought it would be pretty interesting it probably is helpful also you learn a little uh case law learn a little bit about your rights and you can definitely apply this to what's going on today um this is from 1978 it could you might as well be 2021 um you know talking about the, uh, police action law enforcement doing certain things but um at least you have better um you're better informed about what due process actually means and also what entrapment means. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, please like and subscribe, uh, click the links below, uh, support my channel and, uh, I'll see you guys on the next video.